Hello and welcome to the Albion Obsessed podcast. We come to you today on the back of a thrilling victory in London. Once again, Brighton come away from London with all three points. But before we dive into that, let's see who we've got on the show today. We welcome back Aaron. Aaron, mate, how are you doing? Good, thank you, Tom. Very good after the weekend. Good skills, that's all we can ask for. It was a pretty decent weekend. It really threw me that the football was on a Sunday. I could have sworn today was Sunday, but it's not. It's Monday. Uh, But anyway, less about me not knowing what day of the week it is. Uh, Curtis, Curtis, my friend, I've seen you already once today, but how are you? Have you been in the intervening hours? Just as good as I was earlier. You know, it's been a day, but I'm happy to be with you wonderful people. Fantastic. And if you are wondering listeners and watchers what exactly brought me to curtis's door it was this i had a a match day program from 1983 to give him and he in return gave my son a gully and he has played with it this afternoon and it has really hit hit home so thank you curtis for that that was a wonderful trade and we also welcome back the man the myth the legend one of the co-founders of albion obsessed which is one year old today we welcome back toby toby my friend how are you keeping thank you very much thank you yeah uh absolutely wonderful mate um one year of and I, I don't like to take any credit for it because honestly, Joe is the one that's put in the hard graph. I've said it so many times on Twitter and not so many times on here. Joe is just, he's a grafter. Um, and we're lucky that we've got, you know, talented people such as yourself as well, Tom. Uh, th- that's just made this thing into what it is. And, you know, I'm cheering up a little bit here actually, but um, it, it has truly been an amazing journey. And, one that is just going to hopefully keep on rolling. Uh, season two, who'd have thought? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, good to be here. And it is good to have you, my friend. Curtis has donned a party hat for the occasion. I thought, I thought about a dress up for the occasion, you know. <laughs> reminds me, uh, and I'm completely like digressing here, but it reminds me of when we did a Christmas episode and Toby had his little uh, little Santa Claus hat. Oh, good the, only, yeah. the only Santa hat I had in the building was one just about the size of your thumb. <laughs> I hope that comes out again this Christmas, Toby. I really do. Um, yeah, just before we dive into uh, the West Ham episode, yeah, it is our one-year anniversary today. Um, and Albion Obsessed has turned one. And just want to say a massive uh, thank you and shout out to all the guests we've had on. Um, you know, we've had the pleasure of interviewing some really fantastic people, people from Peter Ward, Craig McHale Smith, Johnny Cantor. Um, the Brighton Bard, the Attila, the stockbroker, you know, the list goes on and we've got some fantastic uh, stuff coming to you. We're talking to the one and only Brian Horton tomorrow. And I'm sure the Albion obsessed dads are absolutely uh, the, they were my dad. I don't know about yours, Aaron, but my dad is so, so excited um, that we're chatting yeah, to he Brian is. Horton. Yeah, he, he, he really is. When I told him, when I told him yesterday, uh, yeah, he was like a kid at Christmas. Tom, apparently we're massive. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> we certainly are, Curtis. We are massive. Um, but yeah, we've got some really exciting more content coming your way. We, of course, just released our Albion Obsessed Shirt Collectors uh, episode as well. So give that a watch if you haven't done already. So yeah, lots of really exciting stuff still to come from Albion Obsessed. Uh, year number two is going to be bigger and better than year one. And year one was pretty damn good. So let's start off uh, in the way we mean to go on and let's talk West Ham. But before we, but I've done it again, before we even get into West Ham, the news came out uh, earlier in the week that apparently Manchester United were interested in re-signing Danny Welbeck. How true that was, of course, I don't know. Um, however, what I do know is that the club have extended Danny Welbeck's contract, taking him until 2024. Aaron, what did you make of the news that Danny Welbeck had had his co- um, his contract extended with the club? I don't know. It, it felt like it was it, people just sort of forgot that his contract expired in last year. Uh, last year, it's just been sort of it gone quite quiet on that front. I think it was always going to happen. I think after the the West Ham game last year, the one at home where Potter said, you know, oh, Gross and Welbeck will sign new deals, and they did. 
well, Gross did, and obviously now Welbeck's got his extended. I'm not surprised. I think we're we're a better team with Welbeck up up top, and I, I think it's it's proven that. To be honest, our run of form has sort of coincided with with him starting up top on his own, and I think that's the, the reason why we're doing so well at the moment. So long may it continue. Yeah, and we'll talk about um, the kind of trouble that Welbeck caused. West Ham um, in a while. Uh, but Curtis, what did you make of the contract extension? Obviously, there's been a lot of um, rumours flying around in regards to Neil Mope possibly leaving the club. Um, do you think that is in part due to Danny Welbeck's, well, excellent run of form? I, I think so. I think Neil would want regular football. Um, and understandably, he's you know he's a young guy and everything and he, you know, he wants to play. Um, but it's hard to not play Danny at the moment, considering the excellent form he's in and the form that he was in towards the end of the last season. And it's sort of a shame because he came into such excellent form towards, you know, the last few games of that season. So it's great to see him uh, kicking on and still doing as, as well as he uh, is. And he's, he's just looked fantastic. You know, he's, he's bulked up, uh, you know, it looks, he looks mad. He's a, he's a menace now. Menace. He certainly has. Those pictures of Danny in pre-season were, uh, were he, he was looking swole, as the kids of the youth of today say. He was looking hench. Uh, Toby, what have you made of Danny Welbeck's recent form, uh, his contract extension as well? Um, do you think he is the man to lead Brighton's line this season? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we should get a petition going to rename him Danny Swolbeck because he's just, he's just so hench. Um yeah, Swalbeck, he, he's, you know, he's been to the biggest clubs in the world, Man United, Arsenal. And because you're at that sort of club, you never get a chance to be the star man. He went to Watford, got a couple of injuries, and then they just didn't trust in him. It seems like Graham Potter has sat him down and said, mate, you had really good form when you used to play for England. Man United didn't trust you, so you went to Arsenal. Arsenal didn't trust you. You got injured at Watford. Finally, he's got a manager that trusts him. Finally, he's got the time that he needs to show how good he is. And, you know, I, I can't, I don't even think he's scored a goal this season. And yet he's been one of our best players. And for, for me to come out about a Brighton striker and say he's not scored, but he's one of our best players, it speaks volumes as to what he does for this club. Uh, absolutely the man to lead us forward. I think he, um, and I, I hate to say it because I know that there's a lot of, Neil fans out there, but he is what Neil was about to be before he dropped off in form, I think, because we all said it. Neil doesn't score as many goals as we'd like, but he adds to the team in other ways. And I think Welbeck's doing that, but two times as much at the moment. So, yeah, very happy with him. Yeah, it's very, you mentioned um, something really important there, Toby, the fact that Danny Welbeck hasn't scored so far this season in the three games we have played. Yet in every single game, he has just caused so many problems for the defence, maybe to a lesser extent against Newcastle, but definitely against Manchester United and what we saw yesterday at West Ham, causing the defenders all sorts of problems. You know, he he, he comes in, he, he's hold-up players excellent. Um, he can run in, in the channels. He's just a very good all-round striker. And it means that so many of the players that play off, off him, be it Pascal Gross, Adam Lallana, you know, Kumwepu, they've just got so many options of whether they come short, whether they go long. Um, so he just gives us, uh, you know, some fantastic options. And we'll talk, as I say, a bit more about his uh, performance against West Ham in just a little while. But as ever, let's talk pre-match. Um, Aaron, Brighton hadn't lost in the capital since the 2021 season. Um, and our record against West Ham has been, well, it's been excellent. We haven't lost to them in our Premier League uh, era. Do these records actually mean anything? Do you think they play on the player's mind beforehand? Will David Moyes have gone into this game thinking, oh, we've never beaten Brighton? And will have that have had an effect on the players who, let's be honest, who haven't started this season well at all? Uh, West Ham not having even scored this season. Will that have all played on their mind before the match? I mean, it shouldn't have because, you know, at the end of the day, they are professional footballers. They, they you know... There are some teams you can't beat, like well, you struggle to beat. There's bogey teams. There's bogey teams. Everyone in the league, we're West Ham's, and it doesn't matter really what what they do. They just can't seem to beat us. Even when they have go three one up, we come back to you know get three all and just little things like that. I think it, you know it 
is it partly down to luck? Is it partly down to, you know, their mistakes, their issues mentally, potentially? But at the end of the day is, you know, you can only really beat what's in front of you and they can't seem to beat us. So I'm not, I'm not going to complain about that, to be honest. But regarding the... Uh, the I haven't lost this in London. Uh, I think that in itself speaks volumes. Um, I said it last year where I feel when you're playing in the capital, it seems to be a lot more hype around it personally. I, I think, you know, it's a lot more fans will be more up for it because you can sort of make a, make a day of it. You can, you go up to London, you, you get to Victoria, for example, you have a couple of drinks at the station, then you make your way under the underground, get another couple of drinks at a pub near the ground, etc. Where it can be it can be difficult. Um you know, further up north, obviously, depending how how you wanna how far you wanna go. And you know, the teams in London, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, you know, in the Premier League, you know, and it's that in itself is impressive. To, to be unbeaten in London for so long, it's, especially with the Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, you know, it's impressive. Really is impressive. Curtis, do you think these things, unbeaten in London, uh, never lost to West Ham, do you think they mean as much to the players as they do the fans? Because as as fans, we go, yeah, we've never, we haven't lost in London since 2020, 2021. Yeah, West Ham have never beaten us. Do you think that, helps Brighton players and uh, you know on the flip side doesn't help West Ham players prepare for a match um I don't I don't think the players really think of it like that because you know we only say that because uh, you know we, we see the score line at the end of it and we're like oh you know that was that was really easy for us we played them off the park whatever but I imagine on the pitch you know for the 90 minutes or whatever it's bloody hard you know and I mean I'm not a football player, so I, ca I can't comment on it really. But um, yeah, I, I can't imagine that that way. You know, they don't think of it like that. Like, oh, this will be a breeze. We've beaten them X amount of times before. Um, although on the flip side, you maybe have to think that maybe they're like, okay, we haven't won this many games against them. We've really got to do something today. We've really got to try and prove something. So maybe that weighs a little bit heavy on them, but I wouldn't say it was the other way around so much. Interesting points, Curtis. Interesting points. Perhaps maybe it is more important or the fans perhaps take more stock in these sort of things than the players. I, th I think um, so. I, I, th I think maybe we like to we like to say, ha, ah, we've we've done this thing for X amount of time. Aren't we great? You know, which is cool and everything. It's cool to, it's cool to have these things. But I'd, I'd prefer to, you know, uh, be a load of teams as opposed to just one team a load of times. So. Yeah, I see what you're getting at there. Toby, you shook your head there. Do you think um, that Brighton players will be like, oh, we need to keep this record intact. We need to keep this undefeated in London. We need to keep this undefeated to West Ham. What do you make of it, mate? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, it plays in the players' minds, both West Ham and Brighton. Um, I watched the All or Nothing documentary, Arsenal. Uh, don't know how many of you have watched it, but if you have, you'll see the scene where Lacazette is talking about oh, if we lose the next game, boys, it's going to be the worst ever start to a Premier League year or ever. And it's like, realistically, that's a nothing thing. But clearly, he's spreading it at lunchtime with his friends and his teammates, and it affects them. And then they went out and won the next game so that they, you know, they didn't look stupid. Um, it, you can see from those sorts of documentaries, it's really interesting. In fact, I would, I would love to have one about Brighton and just see how our players get on behind the scenes. But it's really interesting. You know, some players are really down to earth and humble and some live in this bubble. And um, I think, yeah, it's quite easy for records like that to have that bubble burst sometimes. And you, you do see the true nature of these players. But yeah, I 100% think it does get in their head. Um, you can see it last season, I recall, before we played West Ham on the final day of the season, he was like, oh, it's time to finally set the record straight with Brighton. It got in his head, David Moyes, is what, that's what he said before the game last time. So it's definitely something they think about. Whether or not they take much purchase on it, I don't know, but that's down to the individual. And I do think that players will let stuff like that get inside their heads. Yeah, there must be some sort of psychological edge to it. I know I've heard David Moyes say in the past that, 
you know, Brighton, or we just don't seem to be able to beat them. Um, so I'm sh- I wouldn't be surprised if there was, you know, some things floating about. Whether it's as important to the players as it is the fans uh, remains to be seen. But as you say, Toby, I would absolutely love to see a, you know, behind the scenes Brighton season documentary in the style of what we've seen at, you know, Arsenal Spurs and what we see in the, the Formula the One. Is, well. The question is, Thomas, do we think that Graham Potter is a shouter? No, I think Graham Potter, Potter is a very much an arm round your shoulder kind of guy. He's got, you know, he's got this degree in emotional intelligence and, you know, it's very basic and a very basic comparison. But as a teacher, you know, we, I know as a teacher, if I shout at a pupil, I'm less likely to get a result. I'm much more likely to get better results um, if, you know, I understand the child and what that child needs. Um, obviously, his Graham Potter's working with, a lot bigger egos than I do with children who have, you know, well paid and all the, the rest of it. But I, am, I imagine that the experience is the same. You get you. Some managers will like the shouty shouty, and they may get results from that. But from my, I don't think that necessarily works with the majority of players. Let's put it that way. But anyway, let's less about that and more about the game. Um, just really quickly, it was worth mentioning that Graham Potter did not. Uh, alter the lineup in any way. It was the same starting 11 that started uh, the two uh, previous games against Newcastle and Manchester United, which is only the second time that that's happened. Interesting side note. Um, It's only the second time that Graham Potter has named an unchanged 11 for three games in a row. It'll be interesting to see if we set up differently against uh, Leeds. I can pretty much guarantee that it will be a different 11 against Forest Green Rovers. But um, no, against Leeds, it will be very interesting to see how we set up against that team. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk about the first half then. As we've said already, you know, West Ham, they haven't scored um, in any of their previous two games before the weekend. Um, Aaron, do you think all the pressure was on them? I mean, they did have an early chance where Webster gave the ball away quite cheaply and Ben Rama curled wide. Uh, do you think when that happened, all the West Ham fans will have just think would have just thought to themselves, "Oh, here we go again"? Yeah, I think when you play at uh, the West Ham away, it's always a difficult, difficult game. Uh, it's always, especially with their fans, it's it's one of the places where if the fans turn on you, it can really be in your favour. And I think we've noticed that over the last couple of years. Um, you know, it doesn't matter really. <clears throat> on on how they started it's you know that's really what they've done for about 60 minutes of the game before as you know probably longer than that actually probably about 80 minutes into the game where Sanchez probably had his first real shot to actually save and I think Trossard said in his uh, post-match interview you know we wanted to, we wanted to piss them off you know we wanted to piss the, piss the fans off because if the fans got on their back it, it, it's a horrible place to be because then they'll start moaning at every little thing that player does wrong they'll get on the back backs of the players and I think, to be fair, it, it helps a lot of teams who go there, and, and teams will pick up on that. I don't, in fairness, I don't think we played particularly well in the first half. Personally, I thought we were just sort of were doing okay before before we got the penalty, and then I think that's really what changed changed the game. Really, the momentum I think was still with us before then, but like we weren't really creating many sort of clear cut opportunities or anything like that. West Ham. It was just a very dull sort of sort of 25 minutes, half hour before the penalty, really. I think the diplomatic way of putting it would be it was a professional performance. You're right, Aaron. I mean, West Ham, they didn't really offer anything. The only chance that I thought, well, the, the, the Ben Rana, Rama chance quite early on. And there was that sort of half-hearted appeal for a penalty um, for when Sanchez caught Antonio, but he was offside anyway, so it didn't really matter. But at no point, Curtis, did I think West Ham looked particularly threatening in that first half. And I thought Brighton went about it in a very professional manner. You know, we kept the ball well. A, a few times we were a bit sloppy in possession, but for the most part, we were the better team, were we not? Completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. I mean, for the last few years, uh, I've heard like, oh, we're going to West Ham. I'm like, yeah, bring it on. Like, I haven't really been that concerned, to be to be brutally honest. Um, they just never, they just don't seem to turn up to those games. And... Uh, which is excellent for us, obviously. But, like, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what you were saying about how um, what Aaron was saying about how the first half seemed a little uh, slow, a bit tentative, and I agree. Yeah, a professional thing, as you said, Thomas. Um, but, you know, we, we eased into the game, and it was 
it was good in the end. Yeah, you can't really ask for much more than that. Toby, I thought that Caicedo, Lalana, and Gross uh, made it quite an interesting battle in the midfield. It was very much at time to three on two. And they kept Declan Rice, who is obviously a player who we've mentioned before on this podcast, as a Rolls Royce of a player, I think Aaron called him. Um, they kept him very, very quiet. What did you make of uh, the Brighton first half performance before the penalty? Yeah, well, I thought, to be honest, when the first half was going on before the penalty, I I was getting ready to watch another episode of the expected goals um, because the XG was, you know, it started to look like it might have been racking up for us. And uh, and uh, I was quite disappointed, actually, that we weren't scoring. I thought, oh, it's, especially after the Newcastle game, I thought this is destined for another nil-nil. Um, but there's football's changed this year and there's teams that get it and there's teams that don't and Potter gets it, and Brighton get it, and it's something to do with this sort of dangerous, from the centre of your defence, long ball out to the wing, and then you've got a massive chunk of space. We did it to United, we did it to Newcastle, albeit not as successful, because I think they've got the defence that were ready for it, uh, and we, we did it again to West Ham. Um, I, I think there's a there's a clipper going around about Bournemouth, uh, uh, kickoff routine where they pay it back and then do a long ball and score and then Bappe successfully did it with Messi at the weekend and it's going crazy viral but I don't think it's just from kickoff I think there's this new long ball tactic that just seems to be working this year teams all across the all across Europe are getting it it's working and scoring goals and, and we seem to be doing it well. Um, but it's not the sort of long ball that you imagine you know back in the days that West Ham would used to play it's a long ball that works and looks good while you're working it. Um, just opens up so much space. So, yeah, I, I do think that we're just a team that gets it this season. And we're going to be a team that is no longer expected goals. And now we're going to start outperforming it as we did this game. Yeah, let's certainly hope so. And if there is like any changes or any developments or any progressive tactics that are going to be used in football this season, um, you know, Graham Potter is going to be very much at the, the forefront of that. Um, you know, we saw at the end of last season this whole idea of one at the back where you've got Lewis Dunk and then you've got a, the left hand uh, centre back and the right hand centre back pretty much using overlapping centre backs, which I know is nothing particularly new. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, tactics, because we saw Sheffield United use it quite well in their first season of the Premier League a few seasons ago. But I think just generally speaking, you know, our football has been very progressive um, under Graham Potter over the last six months, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right, Toby. I think it, this season hopefully will turn a corner. We've already seen a quite a topsy-turvy start to this Premier League season. So this is a, a season where I think that if a team can string some consistency together... Who knows what might happen? Um, just before we talk about the penalty, I just wanted to highlight one thing, and that was Lewis Dunk. Uh, I, I, I will go ahead and say this right now. I thought Lewis Dunk was man of the match yesterday. I thought he was just excellent. I thought he was brilliant. Um, some really important blocks later on in the game. But there was just one moment, and we've seen it before, uh, Just the, he's just so cool and calm on the ball and that he chested the ball back to Sanchez. And I just wanted to highlight that. I, I was because hoping you'd mention it, Tom. Like he, he's yeah. so proficient at that. It's yeah. it's masterful. Yeah, and as you you know, as I said, it's not like we haven't seen before. But for a, a centre back to just be so cool and calm and do that in your own box while you've got you know players pressing, it's just it's just fantastic to see. And I put it out on Twitter yesterday. Lewis Dunk is the best English centre back in the world, and there is nothing anyone can say that will change my mind. He is just excellent. I think hands Mate, down should be. In there England's is no. Uh, do you know what? There is no defender in the world other than maybe Sergio Ramos, Thiago Silva. Like you have to be Van Dyke. You have to be top top tier to be as calm as Lewis Dunk is. Honestly, when you look at Harry Maguire for eighty million, I wouldn't accept anything less than three hundred and twenty million for Lewis Dunk. And I'm not even kidding. And, I, you know, I said Lewis Dunk to Burnley back in the day. But, <laughs> again, that was when he retires, basically. That's his retirement plan. Um, no, yeah, absolute. If, if Declan Rice is a Rolls-Royce of a midfielder, then Lewis Dunk is a UFO of a centre-back. 
<laughs> that is a brilliant analogy and I'm here for it. Yeah, he's um, massive praise from for Lewis there because I think, you know, he's just he's had a really good start to the season um and long long may it continue. So let's um let's talk about the Brighton penalty then. Um there was a bit of contention. There was a very long VAR check as to whether it was actually a penalty. What did you make of it, Aaron, in regards to the penalty? Um, definitely a penalty, right? Happened on the line. Right, cool. Uh, I didn't think it was a penalty, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think there's enough contact to bring Welbeck down. And I felt like he went down in stages. When it was when it was given, I was surprised. And when it wasn't overturned, I was surprised. Um, yeah, I, I, just didn't, I just didn't think it was a penalty. I, I, hand, hand on heart, I did not think it was a penalty. And it, it was, a, like I said earlier, it was a turning point in the game. You know, it's just the simple. It's, it's not even... I don't think I can really say much else than that, to be honest. I, I generally did not think it was a penalty. Interesting, interesting. Curtis, what was your view? Uh, Aaron said he doesn't think it was a penalty. What did you think? Uh, I, I too didn't. I, I, I thought that, yeah, Welbeck made quite a lot of it. Um, and like Aaron said, he went, so it was, there were sort of stages to him falling and, and, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, when we were awarded it and it, he went to the check and everything else, I was like, oh, yeah, all right, then fine. I will take it, you know. Um, happy to get that, that bit of luck when we can get it. Because usually it goes against us. So, I suppose you might as well have your say on it as well, Toby, then, mate. Um, what did you think? Penalty? No penalty. Um, I don't think it was a penalty, but I, I think for different reasons. Um, if you go by the absolute rule book, it should be where the foul started, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it looked like it started outside the box and then carried on in. I do think it was a foul. I think there was enough contact that you can say he was brushed down. Um, but the problem the referee now faces is if it's inside the box, it's a penalty and yellow card. If it's outside the box, it's free kick and red card because it's last man. So I think all in all, the referee, I think, made the best possible decision for West Ham because I think a red card would have changed the game more than a penalty from a, a goal from a penalty would have done. Um I also think, refer back to Adam Lallana last season saying Welbeck gets punished for his honesty. You know, he doesn't go down easily. And I think if Welbeck goes down, I'm sort of at the point now where I trust it's a foul because I've seen him stand up when he's been kicked, shoved and, and elbowed. And he goes down at this. He's gone down, honestly, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that actually, Toby, because I was thinking the exact same thing with what Aaron and to uh, Curtis said, sorry, about him going down in stages. I almost thought I could see him going, I need to go down here because if I don't go down, I'm not going to get anything. Um, I was very much of the opinion of you, Toby. I thought it was going to be a free kick. I thought when he went to the VAR check, it was going to get overturned and it would have been a free kick. But as you say, I wonder if the fact that it would then have to be a red card would have changed the referee's uh, mind. Um, but it's just one of those things, isn't it? It was also just worth mentioning, it was a beauty of a through ball um, to get Welbeck on the move. And I think the player that brought him down was the new boy that West Ham had just signed. So it was very much a, kind, a case of... It was his debut as well, I believe. Uh, yeah, I mean, Premier League debut. So good one for him. <laughs> good one for him and a good one for us. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say this as well. I mean, there was a good two minute check um, on the penalty. And so whilst that's happening, Alexis McAllister has picked up the ball. Um, two minutes is a long time to wait, especially in that high pressured situation. Um, I thought he dispatched the penalty really, really well, really cool and calm under pressure. What did you make of the penalty, Aaron? Uh, because we haven't had the best of luck with penalties um, from the last 18 months or so. No, it's a good penalty. Um, like you said, you just kept calm under pressure. You know, those sort of situations, you sort of take yourself away from from everyone and just keep yourself to yourself. And then when it's your time to step up, you, you keep yourself calm and put it away. And that's exactly what he did. And I don't think... Uh, when it was eventually given, I did, was expecting Gross to take it, but then I forgot McAllister. I believe he missed one last year against Wolves, didn't he? But then scored with his second one against Wolves. Um, so, you know, his, his conversion rate is pretty decent as well. We, have, we scored a couple beforehand, if I'm a variety of who against, mind you. So, 
I have to admit, I did feel like he was going to score. I did feel I, I felt pretty confident this time around, and I normally I always feel a little bit up in there. So you know, it's, you know the old saying fifty fifty, you know. But yeah, this time I felt quite confident. Yeah, I did as well. Um, as I say, our record last season, in particular, was a bit uh, was a bit hit and miss, to say the least. Um, I think, as you rightly say, Aaron, out of all the penalty takers last season, I think McAllister had the best uh, goals uh, to penalty ratio, so that's pretty decent. Uh, Curtis, were you uh, hiding behind the cushion as this penalty was being taken, or were you very confident that when Alexis stepped stepped up to take that penalty, it was going to find the back of the net? Um, I saw like a few people online that were like, oh, you know, I wasn't sure Alexis was going to put it away because he seems to be a bit shaky and all this stuff. For me, regardless who's taken it, I'm very, very nervous anyway, just because, you know, it's 50-50, as, as Aaron mentioned. Um, but I don't know, like when I saw him, you know, uh, place the ball and everything, I was like, OK, I think he's got this. I think he's got this. And he, and he got it in and it was beautiful. Really, really nice. Um, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to talk about, um, also have to talk about Danny Welbeck's ability to invite in those fouls to get those opportunities as well. That's really impressive from him as well. And that's another facet he adds to his game um, because like, he, he's not going to be able to make these very, very quick runs to get these goals anymore. So in my opinion, I'd like to be able to see him do that, obviously, but you know, he's a little older now. Um, so yeah, but overall, very good. Very happy with it. Nicely struck penalty, wasn't it, Toby? Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, I was a little bit worried. In fact, I was probably more worried than normal um, because I thought Alexis had a... I don't know why I've got this thought, but I thought Alexis had a bit of a bad record for Brighton with penalties, but I I, I must be wrong uh, because, he, yeah, he dispatched in it immensely. And uh, we talk about, you know, the two-minute wait for the penalty and the, the pressure that's building. But to be honest, in the Premier League, if you've got a penalty, the pressure is already at max. It's already at max. Like you've got to have you've got to have that gear inside you to be ready for that. Um, because any Premier League penalty, as I say, whether you wait two minutes, ten minutes, or or you go instantly, it is the most the most pressurized thing you can do in football, probably. So yeah, no, I'm buzzing for Alexis. Hope to see him on more penalties in the future. Yeah, likewise. I think um, I'm happy to be corrected on this in the comments below. Pretty sure Alexis has taken five penalties and scored four, I think. But again, happy to be corrected. Always happy to learn more, the more you know and all that. So yeah, it was a, a good way to see out the first half. As I say, I thought it was a very professional performance. We were very organised, very well drilled and really limited uh, West Ham, who in the second half did come out and they put early pressure um, on Brighton, which was to be expected, I think. Um, there's a few things I just wanted to mention about that. One is about Big Bob in goal, Aaron, because I thought he there was a couple of times when he just looked so assured when crosses were coming in, when uh, corners were coming in, collected a few. Just how much... I mean, West Ham are quite dangerous from set pieces as well. So how much confidence does that give the centre-backs and all, well, all the players on the pitch to know that Big Bob is going to come and collect those balls? Oh, massive. You know, I can't explain how much confidence we gained from Duncan and Webster while Sanchez is claiming those. Because they're horrible to defend. West Ham have always been very good at set pieces. They were very good last year. They're, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that that's one of their main threats. And the fact we nullified it so well by having Sanchez there, you know, I think it's just a massive, massive bonus. And I, I ref, ref, always refer back to, you know, if we had Ryan in goal, it's a whole different story. It, it, it is, and it's not not slating Ryan, not, not at all, but it is a different story. You know, Ryan's is, is a, a dwarf compared to Sanchez. You know, Sanchez commands that box, and that's one of his main attributes, in my opinion, is, is his height. You know, and, and the fact is, that he, similar to Nick Pope, is you know he, he can spread himself, he can make himself as big as he possibly can. He's a big 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 guy and I think we really saw that probably his best performance I've said so far this season I know it's only three games in but I think he looked really assured yeah he certainly did um we'll talk about the saves you made um in just a little while um 
but no, you're right, Aaron. I think having that calm, collect influence, um, from especially from those lofted balls into the box, is really important. As you say, yesterday, I think if if we had had a shorter goalkeeper of maybe Matt Ryan's stature, um, we probably wouldn't have had um, kept clean sheet. Um, so that was definitely worth just. I just wanted to mention that because obviously this is a time where West Ham were really going for it, and Sanchez had those balls under his control. Can you stop mentioning Sanchez's balls, please, Thomas? <laughs> There's something about this podcast, the Robert Sanchez's balls. We're, we're obsessed. We're obsessed. <laughs> we are, but Robert Sanchez is just so good with the balls. Um, so, anyway, let's talk about that second goal. So, in the build-up to the second goal, it's worth mentioning that West Ham made a few substitutions, and Potter, I thought, did a really good job of switching us up around as well. He brought Lalana off and brought Estupinian on for his debut, and we went back to a back four, and it was just it worked wonders because it, within moments uh, we got a goal. Um, it has to be said, it was against the run of play. The ball was played forward um, from McAllister to Gross, who delivered the loveliest. The loveliest of little touches to put Trossard through on goal and he sweeps home past Fabianski. It was a thing of beauty, Curtis. What did you make of that second goal? Um, Because <laughs> I, I, I said that we had a, a bit of a run of play and everything. And then there was a... then Who passed to Gross initially? Was it... Uh, McAllister, I believe. McAllister, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was. It was just all like a real perfect seamless effort you know and you should say that that wonderful little assist to just tuck it round for Trossard and Trossard being as professional as he had just tucking it home and oh man it was it was it was fantastic really really great goal um you know the the celebration again um it was just fantastic really really happy to 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 see him um to, to see him doing well I I think Trossard can be a bit um he can disappear sometimes, but when he's on point, he's fantastic. Yeah, he was. Um, yesterday, um, just talking of the, of the celebration, it was really nice to see when he was doing, Trossard was doing all that. Uh, well, Beck coming behind him and doing it. It's like Trossard on his sightseeing tour of London. What do you see? What do you see, Leo? Oh, I see another three points. Um, <laughs> Toby, there are talks uh, on social media at the moment of Everton going in for Trossard. Um we need to sign this boy up to a new contract, do we not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just before I get on to Trossard, I just want to say Pascal Gross, wunderbar. He is creme de la creme at the moment. Um, before he signed, before he was going to sign the contract, you know, he had those last few games where he started popping them in and doing well. And then he signed the contract and boy, am I glad he did, especially against United when he's already paid his worth with those two goals against United. And then even more so with that flick. Oh, absolutely wonderful. But, but uh, Trossard, got to keep him, got to keep him. He's, he's the perfect footballer for us at the moment as well as the perfect man and the perfect person should I say because you see his leadership skills from when he was captain back in Belgium um you know you can't you can't buy that you can't buy that and to go to Everton that part of his personality would just be wasted because Everton just chuck money at it, chuck money at it, chuck money at it every year it's like chuck money at it Frank Lampard play style chuck money at it Oh, your, your defence is bad. Chuck Murray at it. it. And, you know, at Brighton, we're sculpting something. It's so refined. Down to the last detail, it's so perfect. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's it would just be such a shame to lose someone of his, his stature, what he means to us as a club. I mean, I don't want to say, I don't want to do the, why would he downgrade? But why, why would he? They, like, le legitimately, like, Everton have been poor. You know, I don't, I don't understand why. Yeah, and T Toby's right. It's it's the moolah, it's the dollar, it's the it's the shekels. Obviously, if that's thrown at you, then you'd you'd, you'd probably take it. But like, I I don't know, man. I don't know why you would currently anyway. No, Everton are not the club they once were. Um, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head, Toby. It almost seems a case of things aren't going the way we want them or need them to go. So we're just going to throw money at it. I mean, they signed Deli Ali for goodness sakes, and look what he. Well, he failed to do last season. Um, I don't think Trossar is that sort of mercenary. 
Um, however, you know, there, there'll become a point where, you know, money will talk, but let's hope that uh, we can we get him to sign another contract. I think Grand Potter hinted uh, in as much that he will do. Um, so let's hope that that does happen. Um, before we move on, though, Aaron, I just want to get your uh, quick take on the goal. Lovely build up play, lovely goal. What did you make of it, mate? Oh, yeah, it was just it was superb. I don't think you can read so much more than that, to be honest. The, 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 the pass, the flick from Gross was magnificent. The, the finish was great. Not really much else you could say. The, the pain in your eyes complimenting Gross there, Aaron. You were like, the assist, really good. No, no, I'm all good now. I've, I've got past all the the anger and the hate. I think. Good, good. Yeah, I think I think I did see some stats on um, on on the computer yesterday about Pascal Gross's last like ten games about how many goals and assists he's got, and it's a really really high number. So you know, I think he's one of those people that you know I said I said in a previous podcast he's almost under a renaissance under Potter, and it just goes to show you what a fantastic manager we have and just really coming back quickly to Leo there. Why on earth would you leave Brighton and Hove Albion who are coached under probably one of, if not the most progressive, exciting coaches in the world to go and play with someone in Frank Lampard, who quite frankly is out of his depth. I think um, it's, we spoke about last week about how, uh, Villa versus uh, Everton was billed as like the big battle of the British managers. Whereas quietly to the side, you had two of the actual best British managers in Eddie Howe and Graham Potter, you know? So I just, I don't understand the hype around Lampard and I think he's being found out personally. Um, but no, it was a fantastic goal from Trossard that made it a uh, two nil. And from then on out, it was, um, I wouldn't say relatively comfortable. We had a chance to make it three nil Curtis Estepinian put in a lovely ball, March unmarked in the area came to him. He headed over the bar. Um, I'm not going to be too harsh on Solly because I do think he had a, a good game and I do think he's made a really good start to the season. But in all honesty, Curtis, should Solly have scored that? Yes. Short, swift, sweet and simple. I love no, it. no, but, but legitimately, yeah, I mean, like, I agree. I thought he was, he had a great, a great game as well yesterday. Um, there was a, he had a couple of uh, shots on goal, I believe. Uh, so he was quite unlucky to not get anything um, out of that out of that game. But that uh, headed ball definitely looked it looked like a sure thing, and and I it was almost like slow motion when I saw it happen. And when it oh, I was I was annoyed, but it was it would have capped off a an almost perfect team performance, you know. Uh, yeah, just a shame he didn't get it. Yeah, especially Toby, as it would have meant a debut assist from our new left back Estupinian, Purvis Estupinian. What have you made of his brief cameo yesterday? Yeah, I mean the stars almost aligned. Uh, I think that Solly uh, deserved a goal after the way he started the season. It would be nice to see him get it. Uh, almost the same as what we said about Welbeck, but playing good doesn't necessarily mean scoring goals. And uh, Purvis, wow, well. Uh, just in that short cameo that I've seen of him there, I'm sort of thinking, you know, have we played a blinder here? Have we have we got rid of our king to get in an ace? Because um, Kukurea, you know, he was fantastic for us, but the, the small signs of what Purvis showed us yesterday, absolutely no doubt in my mind he can go on to achieve great things with us. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's all it's always very um, difficult to tell from a brief uh, substitute appearance for about mm, let's say twenty five minutes. But I thought he looked really, really good um, in what we saw, and it, again, it gives us that option of playing a back four, which I know we've been quite vocal against um, because we tend to play better with a three or a five at the back. Uh, Aaron, what did you make of Purvis Estupinian's uh, twenty five minutes yesterday? I can't hear a fucking thing. You guys are lagging so much. I have no idea what you just said. Muy bien, muy bien. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll have to ed edit that bit out then. <laughs> Is it okay? Um, Aaron, Aaron, give us a wave. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I said... Uh, Estupinian had a, a brief, 
albeit uh, exciting cameo yesterday. What did you make of his 25 minutes or so on the pitch? Yeah, look good. I think he, going forward, he looked good in defence. He looked good, and I, I feel like it's a lot, probably, if not a like a like replacement, it may be a, a slight Im- improvement pot- potentially. Um, and that's not taking it away from Mark, but I think if you want to fuck off after one season because of money, then by all means, and we've signed someone probably a bit a, a, looks like he wants to be here, and hopefully it's. He's here for many, many years because he looks very good. He played that beautiful cross for Soddy, who you know should really score. To be honest, there's no reason why he shouldn't. But it, yeah, it looks good. Hopefully, we'll see more of him on on Wednesday night. I'd imagine he'll probably start Wednesday and uh, go from there. Yeah, I think just in regards to Mark Kukurea, I think um, I know we've had our say about that whole transfer saga. But I think seeing the comments post uh, transfer. Have made me. It's, it's made the relationship yeah, that, sour even more. Yeah, that sort of that sort of shit was ridiculous. Well, I'm not being funny. Oh, I drove past Stamford Bridge and thought oh, I can't wait to play here. How? Why are you? Why? How has that even happened? You, you flew in from Gatwick and went straight south. I don't understand how that happened. So it you was probably- clearly just making up utter utter bullshit to try and kiss ass the, the Chelsea fan to in a year's time won't like you anyway because they're so hot and cold on new players so it's cool you'll, you'll be back in spain at, at some point playing for Getafe again so just deal with that oh throwing shade but it's true it's a bit of a kick in the teeth i thought it was quite i know i, I said i didn't want to prolong the point but it was quite telling that his kukurea's wife put more of a thank you and goodbye message out on social media than mark kukurea did but anyway we move because it looks like we've got one hell of a replacement in Perves Estupinian. Um, so one last thing before we kind of like wrap up um, our West Ham analysis. And that was just, it was worth mentioning that Sanchez had to pull off some absolutely fantastic saves uh, towards the end of the game. Curtis, uh, what did you make of the two big saves that uh, Sanchez had to make? I mean, I mean, it's an overall thing. I thought he had a very professional performance yesterday. I thought that, I always, I tend to worry a little bit about Sanchez sometimes because he's kind of prone to a mistake, but isn't every goalkeeper seemingly. So I, I try not to think about that too much. Um, but he, he just looks so calm and collected. And I feel like he had so much confidence in the team in front of him that he wasn't he wasn't so worried about these long balls coming in and he knew that he was able to get to them and stuff like that. But yeah, I just think proper commanding and professional performances today. And yeah, really, uh, those saves were really pivotal to keeping us in the game. So, Yeah, they certainly were. I think the second one from Bowen's header from a corner, especially, I thought was fantastic. Uh, just really briefly then, Toby, what did you make of the, those two big saves from Sanchek? The first one from Suchek, I believe, and as I say, the second one from um, from Bowen. Yeah, I mean, Aaron's the goalkeeper, so I'm sure he's about to tell you all about what Rob, Robert Sanchez did well. Uh, but you know, from your, uh, I don't want to say casual fan, because I think I'm more into football than the casual would be, but from your fan that, you know, sits and watches uh, and doesn't really partake too much in football, um, like, he, he just, you feel comfortable with him in goal. I, I think, you know, Aaron touched on it earlier, Ryan was a different type of player, and there's some parts where Ryan you know, you wouldn't feel comfortable with Ryan in that situation. But it feels like Sanchez, in almost every situation, I can feel somewhat comfortable. And even when a player gets through 1v1, I'm still thinking, we've got a good chance here. Normally, I'd give up. But with Sanchez in goal, again, I just feel comfortable and at peace. (laughs) I like that. I like that. I I do agree. He fills me with a lot more confidence. Uh, than Matty Ryan did. Uh, Aaron, really briefly then, what did you make of those saves from Big Bob? Because, I mean, it's, it seemed like he had springs in his shoes. Sec, second one's very good. The second one's a very good save. The first one I felt was more for the cameras more than anything, personally. Um, I feel like he made that look a lot more dramatic than it needed to be, but it looked really good. Um, and as a goalkeeper, that's also what you like to do. Um yeah, the second one, I think both of them were from Suchek, I think. Both both headers were from Suchek. The second one especially was a very good save. 
if that goes in, that changes the game. I, I think, like I said, the first one was a simpler save, made to look very good. And the second save was a, just a very, very good save. And I refer back to what I said earlier. Sometimes he, you know, you look at keepers we had in the past, and you think, you know, it would 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 Ryan have got that? Probably not. We wouldn't have got the first one either. To be fair, it's in the top corner. He's only short, bless him. Um, but no, I think yeah, two good saves. Not didn't keep us in it, but it, it kept any sort of West Ham comeback from ever sort of materialising. Yep, very important saves there from Big Bob because even if we still were, would have been in the lead, it com- completely changes the complexities of the game. Uh, West Ham then have a chance, um, but of course we they didn't because Big. By Bob the way, and- did you guys see that Mendy howl like yesterday? Is that Chelsea. I haven't was- seen it. I've heard of it, but again, it goes to show. I mean, I'm reading a really interesting book at the moment uh, that was gifted to us as uh, Albion Obsessed because it's about two Brighton goalkeepers, and it's really interesting to to see it from a goalkeeper perspective. As and I'm sure Aaron, you'll agree with this. Um, at, well, I've said, we've said it before. Outfield players they make mistakes and they can brush it off if they continue to have a good game. A goalkeeper makes a mistake and it's going to be the thing that's splashed on the back page. It's going to be the thing that's analysed again and again and again and again. Um, so, you know, I mean, from my perspective, it's not Brighton, so I'm not overly first. Um, and I'm just glad it didn't happen to us. I'm just glad we, we don't have a keeper that tries that sort of stuff. Like it, it, Sanchez, he might try a risky pass every now and then, but to dr- try and have to cheat to dribble it around a player that is barreling down at you, I thought it was awful. And uh, yeah, it just makes me even more thankful for Robert Sanchez. Yeah, it's it, as I say, it's one of those things. I'm just very grateful that we've got Big Bob. Um, the only thing, as you say, Toby, occasional uh, just passing it to the opposition for fun, but you know. We live, we learn, we move. Um, so the, we wrapped up the game, guys. As I say, it was a very professional performance. It's also worth mentioning that we kept a clean sheet, um, we, as you, as we as we know. But it's um, the only goal we've conceded this season is one we've scored against ourselves. So I think that's a pretty good way of looking at it. We've also what um, go unbeaten in our first three matches in the Premier League, which is the first time we've done that. Um, so all in all, a really good weekend from Brighton. I'm going to push you now, guys, for your player of the match. Uh, I'll come to you first, Toby. Which player impressed you the most yesterday? Yeah, it's so difficult. Um, you know, even for the game against United, you've only got to say Pascal for the two goals. But when it comes to a game like this, where every player put in the shift, Welbeck did enough to earn the penalty that McAllister scored, Pascal did enough to get a flick on to Trossard, who scored. It, it's impossible to stay. So I, the thing I'll back you with and go with the defender because at, they're the reason we're looking so solid at the moment. And I, I think I'm also going to go for that man in the centre, Lewis Dunk. So composed, so safe, so calm. The back line, all of them just look incredible. All 11, all, all, all of the subs too. Um, yeah, just really great from Brighton at the moment. Well said, Toby. Well said, mate. Uh, Aaron, who was your player of the match yesterday? I don't really think you can pinpoint one, in, in my opinion. I, I think it was just a, overall a very good team performance. And I, 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 you could give it to literally anyone. And that's not me being being awkward. I, I don't want to give it to just one person because I think it was, just a, like you said earlier, a very professional performance. So for me, the team were, the, were, were all player of the match. Again, really well said, mate. Really well said. Curtis, do you view the game similarly to Toby and Aaron? Do you think it was um, a, a team yeah. performance? It was, it was just, uh, it was almost like a perfect team performance. Everything just went right. They gelled so well. Um, and yeah, like what Aaron said, it's almost hard just, just to pick one person, but I'm going to say Caicedo. I thought he was he was really, really great yesterday. Really bossed the midfield there. So, uh, Caicedo. Very good, very good. Um, you know, I've already said that Lewis Dunk was my man of the match, but I do agree wholeheartedly with you, Toby and Aaron. It was one of those games where I don't think anyone was super flashy or did anything that was like amazing and world beating. But what everyone did was everyone did their jobs. And that's why I think is so good about this Brighton side under Potter is everyone knows what they need to do and where they need to be. 
And that makes us an incredibly hard team to beat. And just really quickly, guys, um, our away record for the last seven games. So we've played seven, won five, drawn one, lost one. We've scored 11 goals. We've conceded six and we've picked up 16 points. I mean, wasn't the loss to Man City as well? Yep. And the okay. loss was to Manchester City. So no, you know, no sort of like ooh, we we could have we should have done better there. No, because it's Manchester City. Um, and I know we we're not a Manchester City podcast, but that game against Newcastle yesterday was mad. But it does go to show you that this could be a very interesting Premier League season. You know, Leeds beat Chelsea, uh, Fulham drew with Liverpool. Um, you know, Manchester United are falling off a cliff. Um, it's a very interesting Premier League season. And it makes me think that a well-drilled, a well-organised and a well-coached Brighton side could be one of those teams that is very much knocking on the door of the established big or top six. I do think, boys, and I'm, this might be just pie in the sky, overly optimistic. I know things can change very quickly in the world of football. I think this could be a year that Brighton make huge, huge strides. Do you think I'm wrong, boys? Do you think I'm being a bit sort of... You're right. You're right. Um, I mean, you can already take Man United and tick them off as outside the top six, in my opinion. They look absolutely nowhere near what a top six side should be. So that's one slot opened up for us. And it's it's hard to see, with West Ham doing so poorly, poorly it's hard to see who takes that spot if it's not us. Because I, I really think Leeds are going to drop off. That's not to underestimate them for our next game. They're in good form, the same as us. But I really think Leeds are going to drop off, whereas we've shown that we can do it over the course of a season now. We had bad patches last season. We came back. Listen, we dare to dream every year. Every time me and Joe have talked about football together, we dare to dream. And, we, you know, we maybe bump Brighton up a few places on our prediction. You know, I'm someone who this year hasn't been able to make a prediction of what the table will finish as. And the season's already started and I still can't. There is no chance. This is, as you say, a topsy-turvy league this year. Who knows? It could be an Arsenal-Brighton 1-2. Do you know what I mean? It's it's looking that way. Uh, definitely some shocks in store this season. Uh, definitely looking for that, that extra slot that's freed up by Man United. Yeah, as I'm sure the likes of Leeds and Newcastle will be after their fine starts to the season, respectively. Um we do face Leeds next, um, and Aaron, I was um, I was tipping Leeds to be near the bottom of the table, but they've started really well, have they not? Uh, Jesse March has got them playing really nice football, beat Chelsea the other day. It's going to be a pretty tough game at the weekend, is it? Yeah, I think, I think uh, I'm pretty sure I have my Leeds down around the bottom four, bottom five. It, it still could happen. It's still early doors, but I think credit to Jesse, I think he's, he's actually seems to get them playing a bit more of a sensible style of football um, instead of playing Bielsa ball or whatever the hell they called it, um, where you just run around for 90 minutes and just leaving gaps everywhere. That's, that's going to cause issues. And it, it's the first time he's had an actual pre-season to sit them down and go, this is the way I want to play. And they've started off well. And, you, you know, it will be a very different game Saturday. It'll be a very different game from from what we're used to, to from playing against Leeds in, in, in years gone by, yeah, fair play to like I said, fair play to Jesse. I don't think you can don't want to blow smoke up their arse so much, but they've done well. They have done well. They certainly have, Curtis. Do you think there'll be any changes for the game um, against Leeds at the weekend? Um, as Aaron says, they're going to play a completely different style of football to the likes of West Ham, Manchester United. Um, and perhaps even Newcastle as well. Do you see any changes in the starting eleven? How do you think Potter will set up? Um, hmm, potentially, I, I think maybe maybe they maybe they could. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. I'm kind of unsure about it. They, but I think maybe uh, the Forest Green game will be a good sort of like uh, sort of a good bit of. Uh, we can just tell who's looking good and then maybe Potter might be like, hang on, him. He's he's all right. Uh, but I'd like to see Matoma maybe start at some point. I think that'd be really good. Um, you know, and maybe Undav eventually. That'd be nice too. Um, but I, I don't know. Probably knowing Potter, it'll probably be largely unchanged. Um, maybe have Lalana sit out maybe against Leeds. 
You don't think so, Toby? No, no. Okay. Well, I think everyone, well, honestly, honestly, everyone of those eleven have put in the shifts three games in a row now. Let's keep it that way. And barring injuries, let's keep it that way. Let's keep that consistency because that's that's how Leicester did it as well. They had that one squad of eleven basically who just tore it up all year. Luckily, they didn't have the injuries that year. So yeah, let's let's keep it rolling. I say let's keep the good times rolling. Yeah, I think you're probably right there, Toby. I think it would be good to see um, an unchanged eleven. I think Lallana is probably the most likely one to drop out. Um, but I hope he starts because I think he's had a really positive start to the season. Um, you know, I think he's a vastly underrated player for us. Um, so I definitely hope that we we see him start against Leeds. But let's quickly chat about Forest Green then. Um, we go and play them at the new lawn on Wednesday, a ground that I've visited many times. Um, I've watched, I watched Bobby Sanchez make his uh, debut there, actually. Um, uh, I think I've told the story before. I turned to my wife and said, he's going to be Brighton's number one one day. Um, but no, um, to the fans that are travelling um, to Gloucestershire, you're in for a treat. The food is lovely. Believe it or not, vegans don't just eat grass. Uh, the food there is award-winning. It is lovely. <laughs> Shush, Aaron. Shush. No, no, the food there is really good. Um, it's won loads of awards. Uh, the Green Man Pub is really decent, so make sure you stop off in there. Um, but no, I know a, fan, a few fans are chatting about where to park. There's a park and ride, three pounds. It's like a, a little industrial park, about 10 minute drive away. Check on the Forest Green website. It will tell you how to get there. Um, Toby, if you could pick one player from, I suppose, the uh, the fringe players that you'd like to see start against Forest Green Rovers, who would it be and why? Oh, mate, we've got so many exciting ones. If, if, do I have to pick one? <laughs> one. You're allowed to pick one. For, for me, for me in, in CISO, um, because I think Mitoma and Undav will get their chance in the Premier League. I don't think they're reliant on these cup games, whereas I think in CISO is, is really reliant on breaking through still. I still think he's quite a youngster, um, so he does still need to break through. Uh, whereas I think the other two have, have sort of done that already. Um, whether or not their performances live up to it is a different story. But yeah, and see, so really, really exciting. I thought, you know, pre-season friendlies, he was looking top of our first team almost. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking, hang on, are we going to start the season with Enciso playing? This young Paraguayan superstar seems to have such a big following in Paraguay. <laughs> um, yeah, so Enciso for me. Yeah, I like that reasoning a lot, Toby, because I think you're right. I think Undav and Matoma's time will come, whereas, as you say, and CISO uh, might have to prove himself before he's uh, he's started. Aaron, same question to you, my friend. Which of our fringe players do you think will uh, be be playing at Forest Green and which one are you excited to see the most? Uh, I, think, I agree with Toby, to be honest. I, I literally, all I can say is it, I would like to see and CISO, and that's literally it, really. Very good, very good. Same question to you, Curtis. I hate to be boring, but I agree with the with the other lads, really. And see, so I'd like to see some Van Van Heck, obviously. I, I don't know, he's uh, probably about to go out on loan uh, to Sunderland, I think it is, if I'm correct. Um, and sign a new contract with us, which is good, I think. Um, so, yeah, just those two for me. A, a quick shout-out as well. Uh, not 100% sure... If he's got out on loan or anything, I haven't seen anything. Uh, Kozlovsky, if, if he's still in, in Brighton, um, then yeah, I'd love to see him as well. I wanted to say Jeremy Sarmiento, but he's injured as well, isn't he? I forgot about that. He is, but I'm pretty sure I saw him in a training uh, picture the other day. Um, I do think that he, he did get injured, but I don't think it was serious because he was sat on the sidelines um, when the under-23s played. So let's hope that it's not too serious because um, he was going to be my pick, uh, Sarmiento. But if he isn't, I'm actually quite looking forward to perhaps seeing Levi Colwell, um, you know, seeing what he's about. Um, I expect him to start. And just really quickly coming to Van Heck, Curtis, because I'm glad you mentioned him, because one thing I will quickly say before we wrap up the episode is that if Van Heck does go on loan, which is looking more and more likely, we will be left with four centre-backs in... Uh, Lewis Dunk, Adam Webster, Joel Veltman, and Levi Colwell. And of course, I know you've got Lamptey, Estupinian, um, so we might just revert to a back four, which we didn't like last season. Um, 
and Matt Clark. Apparently, Middlesbrough are interested in Matt Clark, so it'd be interesting to see if he sticks around. But Aaron, you are right. We've got Matt Clark. I, I, I suppose I just sort of assumed um, that he'd be off. But again, I think, you know, if we look at our last season where it all started to unravel was when Lewis Dunk was injured, Adam Webster was injured, and we were very quickly very short at the back. And then Dan Byrne left. Get my Dan Byrne reference in there. <laughs> um so, yeah, it all quickly unraveled. Um, so I just hope that we don't leave ourselves too light. I know that Potter likes a, a smaller squad, but even so, we shall see what happens. And, of course, at Albion Obsessed, we will bring you breaking transfer news as and when we are able to. But that wraps up our post-West Ham match analysis. Make sure, guys, that you like, share and subscribe because we've got some wonderful content coming your way. As I've already said, guys, tomorrow we are chatting to the one and only Brian Horton. If you don't know who that is, maybe you're a bit of a younger fan. Brian Horton played for the club in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, he was our club captain and he also, all, also managed us when we played uh, one of our home season at <laughs> Gillingham in the late 90s so it's going to be really exciting to chat to him get all of his insight and all of the what was happening behind the scenes about the different players and whatnot it's going to be really really exciting as I said earlier the Albion obsessed dads are losing their collective rude word <laughs> I need to add one thing as well Tom if I if I can and uh, this you know this is not something that I've said to Tom I would say beforehand so um Let's start it now. Listeners, I'm sure you've already seen my tweet. Start the petition. Let's get it going. I want to hear Exiled Seagull, Sussex by the Sea. My heart belongs to Sussex by the Sea. I want to hear it on the 27th against Leeds at home. It, it, this this song, and I've said it in the, in the private chat, um, you know, a lot of fan songs, they can come out and they're sort of a little bit on the cringier side or whatever. But um, this is a, a true masterpiece and belongs to be a part of, you know, hopefully Albion history, but definitely part of Albion obsessed history. What a song. Um, thank you very much for releasing it. I have got it on repeat. So catchy. <laughs> I'm just constantly listening to it. So, yeah, well, well done, Tom, our very own talented and what a masterpiece it is. Thank and you, man. Th thank you very much to all the uh, people who constantly leave your lovely comments and always give us nice feedback and everything. We, we truly appreciate it. We wouldn't be doing this for as long as we've been doing it without you. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, just want to echo what you said there, Curtis. Thank you for the lovely comments about the song as well, guys, um, on you know on Twitter and on YouTube as well. It means a lot. It's a song from the heart. Um, you know, we do this. We, we, we're, just, we're just people that like to talk about football. It means an awful lot to us. Um, so when they say, it's just a game, it's far more than a game to us. Right. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us for this episode. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. If you haven't already, keep your eyes peeled, guys, because we've got big plans this year. Big plans. So take it easy, guys, wherever you may be, whenever you may be. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>